thank you so much to our visiting musicians who led us in worship and who brought us that song about amazing grace. Because without that amazing grace, there is no hope for any of us. My prayer this morning to the holy and faithful church family in Christ here at Laguna Niguel. Grace and peace to you from God our Father. Today may faith and love spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven. Do you know what is God's goal for your life? One of the most common questions that pastors get asked especially at crucial moments in people's lives, is, what's God's plan for me? Or another way they ask it is, what's God's will? Or what's God's purpose? But it all boils, boils down to the same thing. What's his goal? That is often asked, especially in younger years, of what, what career am I, should I choose? Where shall I go to school? Later on, it becomes, what job should I have? Where should I live? What relationships does God want me to enter into? And especially as they're looking forward to perhaps settling down and becoming married. And later on in life, as we go through it, perhaps a new job comes up, a new job offered. Lord, is it your will I take that job? Or we face financial decisions about, should I buy the house or the car, or what should I do? And so we ask, what's God's will? And there are some who believe that God has a plan for each one of our lives. We better find out what that plan is, or we're in trouble. I am not one who believes that. I think there is a goal. In fact, I know there is a goal. I believe that you can know God's goal or purpose for your life. And the truth is, God's goal and purpose for your life is the very same as God's goal and purpose for mine. The Westminster Short Catechism begins, it's not moving forward, it worked, I think, interference, thank you. What is the chief end of man? That's the question. Or what is the goal of man? And the answer is, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him. That's great, but how do we glorify Him and how, how do we enjoy Him? Well, I did my own survey somewhat, although it's not that same question. I did my own survey, and it's not a scientific survey. Didn't have the right number of people from this congregation, but I asked three questions. And the first question was, what is the primary reason that you accepted Jesus? I got a variety of answers. The top number of, of answers was I was raised in a Christian family. In fact, one person even apologized for that. But I would remind you that in Deuteronomy chapter 6, it, God told Moses to tell the children of Israel that they were, when they sat down and when they rose up, when they walked along the way, they were to be teaching and training their children to know and love God. So if you were raised in the church and you didn't have a specific conversion experience, Thank God, your parents did something right. Four, three people said because of spiritual needs, and there were several others that were just one answers. I asked a second question. What is the primary reason you are a follower of Jesus today? The answers, the number one answer was because of my relationship with God. Twelve people answered it that way. Two people said eternal life. They wanted to experience eternal life. One said because of the Sabbath, and one said because of fellowship with other Christians. The third question I asked was what do you think is the primary goal and purpose God has? for Christian Seventh-day Adventists. And I'm going to admit, I was surprised, pleasantly surprised, by the, for the most part, the answers I got. The number one answer was that we have a witness, we have a message to give. Eight people said it's about a message. 
Teach them. That's a message. Teach them God's love. Teach them what we believe. Six people said that the goal is to be like Christ. It was said in a variety of ways. Five people said, I'm going to witness to others through the relationship I have with them. And that could be connected to one above it, but it could be separate as well, right? Two people said, to tell them about eternal life. One person said, to share the Sabbath with them. And, one per- and three people said, to worship and fellowship with God's people. How would you answer that question? What do you think is the primary goal and purpose God has for Christian Seventh-day Adventists? I think there is a definitive answer. And while it is good to seek God's guidance in matters like where we work and where we live and how we should spend our money and finances and all of that thing, who we should marry, what we should do in difficult times... There is a definitive answer, and I've asked Peace to read the scripture for this morning. And just listen and look and hear what God says about his purpose for your life. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. (coughs) And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word... Love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in Him. Whoever claims to live in Him must live as Jesus did. Now you can read that and say, ah, it's obedience. But I want you to notice, first of all, it's not talking about the Ten Commandments. It's talking about what Jesus commanded us in the Gospels, which includes the Ten Commandments, but it's much deeper than that. The Sermon on the Mount, John 14 through 16, 17, excuse me. (coughs) Sorry. John 14 through chapter 17, especially. I want you to notice that verses 6, 5 and 6 is the summary of what Jesus is saying. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus lived. So those who put down that we must be like Christ, that is the definitive answer of God's purpose for our lives. Now you may say, well, Pastor Gary, you've cherry-picked a verse. There's other verses, aren't there? Well, let me just share with you one quote from Ellen White. It's found in the book Education, page 15. Higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's ideal for his children. Godliness, God-likeness is the goal to be reached. Could it be any clearer than that? And godliness and Christ-likeness are the very same. They're no different. There is kind of a mantra about Jesus' life and ministry and what it means to be like Jesus that is used in a number of churches these days, and it's a good mantra. It says that Jesus' life and ministry was that he showed love to everyone. He accepted everyone, and he forgave everyone, and that's what we're supposed to do, and that is good. But it doesn't quite go far enough. There's something more. There's something more. I like what Max Lucado said. Max Lucado said, back one, I think it worked. Let's go. Okay. God loves you just the way you are, but he refuses to leave you that way. He wants you to be just like Jesus. He said it in another book a little bit differently than that. He says he wants to, he loves you too much to leave you that way. He wants you to be just like Jesus. We'll come back to that a little bit later. There is a big clue about God's goal for our lives. It goes all the way back to the story of creation. You remember that story? It says that God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Now, 
God is spirit. And even though Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel painted God as a person reaching out to create Adam, God doesn't have a body. And even though the, body, the Bible talks about the fact that God touches us with his hand and God's eye sees us and God, God's heart reaches out to us and he loves us with his, all his heart, that, that's only so that we can understand God more. But he said, let us make man in our image. But there's certain things about God that we can never possess. We can never be like him in certain ways. We can never be eternal. We, we might live in eternity, but we had a beginning. God doesn't have that. We will never be omniscient. We will never know everything that God knows. We will never be all-powerful. Those things God cannot share with us. But there are certain traits that God has that he wants us to have and he wants us to share with him and, and that he created Adam and Eve to be like him in those ways. And it's interesting that when Moses asked God to reveal his glory or his character to him, God didn't mention righteousness. God didn't mention holiness. God didn't mention uh, the perfection of his being. God mentioned those characteristics that he could share with us. If you read it in Deuteronomy chapter 6, or Exodus, I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 34, he says, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Those characteristics he wants us to have in our relationship with others. And so, if that was God's ideal from the beginning, that we would be in his image, and if those are the characteristics that he described to Moses, and if that's how Jesus lived and, and ministered on this earth, I think that's what it means to be like Christ. I think that's what Christ, uh, I think that's what Christ uh, likeness is all about. So, the question I have for you this morning is, what does it mean to live like Jesus? Well, when you study the life of Jesus, I think you find four ways that we can relate to so that we can have and live the life that Jesus has asked us to live. The first one, Jesus is that prayer empowered Jesus' life and ministry. Prayer empowered Jesus' life and ministry. Luke 6, 12 says, In these days he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. This took place just before he made the final call to his disciples. At every major thing, either before an event or after an event, it talks about Jesus going off to, a, to the desert, Jesus going off to the wilderness, Jesus going off to pray. And I am convinced that we don't know all, because Jesus didn't just have a prayer life, Jesus had a life of prayer. Do you catch the difference? A prayer life is, I pray at this time and this time and this time. A life of prayer says, anytime I need him, I will pray. And so Jesus had a prayer life. And this verse isn't the only verse that, that refers to it. Peace is going to read from John 5, 19 to 20. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will, show, will he show to him, so that you may marvel. Did you notice it says that Jesus saw how the Father worked, and Jesus heard the words of the Father, how did he do, know that? How did he do that? Part of it was he knew the scriptures, but much of it came through his life of prayer. He took up his duties for the day after he'd spent time with God in prayer. He had a life of prayer. Have you ever prayed before you make even a regular phone call to ask God to be in the conversation? I have. I have. It makes a difference. I, I want you to notice something else about Jesus' prayer life. Luke 11, verse 1. 
Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. Jesus had taught the disciples what we call the Lord's Prayer in the Sermon on the Mount. This is later on in his ministry. Why would the disciples ask him, teach us to pray, when he already taught the Lord's Prayer? Have you ever asked that question? I believe it's because they saw the connection between his life and his ministry and his life of prayer. They saw the connection that everything Jesus did was a result of his life of prayer with his Father. And so they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. I I want to stop and make an admission. Let's face it. I don't know any Christian who hasn't at some time or another struggled with their prayer life. And sometimes we wonder if the prayer goes any farther than right here. Right? I mean, let's let's be honest. Doesn't matter. That was the secret of Jesus. If we're going to be Christ-like, it begins here. You You cannot become like Jesus if you don't spend time with God. By beholding, we become changed. The second way Jesus lived his life was that love and compassion motivated Jesus' life and ministry. Love and compassion motivated Jesus' life and ministry. Luke 4, 18 to 19. This has happened right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And it says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. The poor would include those who are physically poor, materially poor, and especially those who are spiritually poor. Anybody here spiritually poor besides me this morning? It says that in his ministry, he would deal with compassion by preaching freedom to the prisoners. And in that day and age, prisoners were prisoners who owed debts and couldn't repay them. But they were also prisoners of sin. He said he would proclaim healing to the blind, the lepers, the demons, the lame. These were people that most people, especially the Christian leaders, considered to be less than out of God's favor, outside of God's love, who didn't belong, who had no business coming to church. Jesus would proclaim healing to them, and he would proclaim the year of God's favor, which is another way of saying he would proclaim that the Messiah had come. Jesus' life and ministry was motivated by his love and compassion. In fact, Jesus was repeatedly moved with compassion. If you read the Gospels over and over again, Jesus saw the crowds and he was moved with compassion for they were like a sheep without the shepherd. Jesus saw the crowds and they were hungry and he was moved with compassion to feed them. And so love and compassion motivated Jesus' life and ministry. But there's another way we need to look at what it means to be Christ-like. Inviting people to know his father was Jesus' basic message. Now, there's another message that goes hand in hand with it, and that's the gospel of the kingdom. The kingdom is here. But remember, the father is also the king of the kingdom. But Jesus' favorite message was for people to know his father. Let's look at Matthew eleven twenty-seven 27 to 30. We usually focus on 28 and 29. Jesus said, all things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. The Son chooses to reveal him. Then he says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus, in context of talking about finding rest in Jesus, we find rest in Jesus because we know that Jesus is like the Father. And we can find rest in the Father too. One of the hardest things that I've dealt with as a pastor 
and I've dealt with personally. If you grew up having a father who loved you and who treated you well, praise God for that. But if you grew up with a father who was abusive, or if you grew up with a father who physically assaulted you, it is hard to call God Father. Many, many Christians have struggled with that. And yet, every one of them who've had that knows what a good father is. And they can know that their father in heaven is the perfect father. And so Jesus wanted to reveal, Jesus wanted to reveal God is the father who loves and cares for his children. In fact, the most famous parable, the most loved parable of Jesus is the parable of the prodigal son. We've referred to that a couple times in previous weeks. It's really not the parable of the prodigal son, it's the parable of the loving father. You see, the prodigal son was a wayward son, a rebellious son, who wanted nothing to do with his father for a time, and he went away. There was an elder brother at home, and he was just as far, if not farther, from his father because he was continually trying to earn the love he already had. But the father, and I learned this from Henry Nolan, the father shows us that he took the shame of both the son who was away and the son who was at home but far from him. He took their shame upon himself. And we are called to be the father. We often like to say, well, I identify with the prodigal son. We don't like to admit we identify with the elder brother, but we do. I said that a couple weeks ago. But we're called to be the father to those who are away from him, to those who don't know him. That's not the only place where it tells us that the Father was the main message that Jesus had, inviting people to know him. John 14, verse 8 to 11. Listen as it is read. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Philip had been with Jesus three and a half years, and he says, show me the Father. Jesus must have been heartbroken. You've seen me all this time, and yet you don't know my Father? I've been telling you about him. I've been showing him. I've been revealing him all this time. In his high priestly prayer, notice what Jesus said to the Father about what he'd, how he'd revealed him to those he come in contact with in John chapter 17, verse 6. I showed what you are like to those you gave me from the world. They belong to you, and you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your teaching. I have shown you them to you, you to them. I have shown you to them. And the result is they belong to you. Jesus invited people to know the Father so that they could know they belong to God. Do you know you belong to God? In all of his actions, in all of his interactions with people, in all of his teaching, Jesus was constantly revealing the Father to everyone he came in contact with. then we see what it means to be like Jesus when we see that Jesus was serving, that serving others was Jesus' method of ministry. In Mark 10, at the beginning, before this passage we're going to read took, takes place, 
James and John came to Jesus. Another, another gospel says that the mother asked them, but it was in James and John's behalf. Jesus, I have a request for you. Can, can you grant that one of us will sit on your right hand and your left hand when you come, come in your glory, when you come into your authority? Can one of us be the prime minister and one of us be the secretary of state, however you want to word it? When the others heard it, they were indignant. When the others heard it, there was conflict. When others heard it, they were, weren't saying nice things about each other. Now, I'm reading between the lines, but if you're indignant, you know that's going to take place. And Jesus responds to them. He calls them together after this time of conflict. And he says, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority or power. They love their power. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus came to serve. Now, some may say, well, Pastor Gary, that's what compassion and love was all about, isn't it? Well, it is possible to be compassionate and loving as a form of manipulation to get others to like you. It's possible to be compassionate and loving so that others will do what you want them to do. It's possible to be compassionate and loving for all the wrong reasons. It requires a servant heart to be truly compassionate and loving. I, I want you to think about it. Jesus was compassionate and loving to all he met. That does not mean he didn't have strong words at time for people. He pronounced woes on the scribes and Pharisees. He turned to Peter one day and says, get behind me, Satan. But he always did it with tears in his eyes and love and compassion in his voice. He did it and he heaped coals of kindness on others. He wasn't always just Jesus the kind and gentle, meek and mild. He could also be Jesus the humbly strong and the one who was willing to speak the truth to people they needed to hear. Jesus served others at all times. And so as you think back to what we've talked about this morning, if we are going to be Christ-like, it begins by saying we need to have a life of prayer. Because if you don't have that, the others won't take place. The others can't happen without that. If you're going to look, as we look back, not only will we have a life of prayer, but we will also live, have a love and compassion for those in need. If, if we're going to be Christ-like, we will have a life of prayer and be loving and compassionate to those in need but we will also invite people to know our Father who's in heaven. And we are also going to serve others rather than desiring to be served. Do you understand my point? I can hear some saying, what about truth and the importance of truth? It's interesting that God revealed himself to Moses and please don't misunderstand this next statement. He didn't list truth as one of his first qualities. The Bible teaches that God has truth. But if we do not teach the truth in order to invite people to know the Father, we have distorted truth. And we have done more harm than good. You say, Pastor Gary, that's awfully harsh. That's awfully harsh. Are you sure about that? I have another statement from Desire of Ages, from the chapter on the Sermon on the Mount. I want to share it with you. Please forward it. I'm, okay. The greatest deception of the human mind in Christ's day was that a mere assent to truth constitutes righteousness. In all human experience, a theoretical knowledge of the truth has been proved to be insufficient for the saving of the soul. It does not bring forth the fruit of righteousness. 
A jealous regard for what is termed theological truth often accompanies a hatred of genuine truth as made manifest in the life. That's why the religious leaders of Jesus' day opposed him so strongly. The same danger still exists. Many take it for granted that they are Christians simply because they subscribe to certain theological tenets. But they have not brought the truth into practical life. They have not believed and loved it. Therefore, they have not received the power and grace that come through sanctification of the truth. Men may profess faith, faith in the truth, but if it does not, and listen to this last sentence, men may profess faith in the truth, but if it does not make them sincere, kind, patient, forbearing, heavenly-minded, it is a curse to its possessors, and through their influence, it is a curse to the world. Wow. Don't misunderstand me. It's possible to have doctrinal truth as your main focus in your life, and you aren't kind and patient and forbearing. It's possible to have grace as the theological tenet that you think is the most important and still be unkind and impatient and unforbearing and, and focused on this world. It's possible to have righteousness by faith as your theological tenet, but without having that come into your life and transforming and changing you. Do you understand what I'm trying to share with you this morning? I want to go back. I want to go back to the mantra I referred to. Back up. Oh. Jesus, in his life and ministry, acted with love. He acted with love when he touched a leper before he healed him. Right? He acted with love when he told a lame man, lame man to take up his bed and walk on Sabbath when he knew that that would cause people to criticize him in his ministry. But he was more concerned with the love that man needed to hear than he was with what people thought of him. Jesus' life and ministry, he accepted people. He accepted Matthew, the tax collector, and Simon the zealot as part of his disciples at two opposite ends of the extremes. If you want to know maybe perhaps a kind of parallel... Simon the Zealot would be a legalist or someone on the right side of the church, and Matthew the tax collector would be on the left side. He showed acceptance to Zacchaeus when he stopped as the crowd was moving, and he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, I hope you've got a good lunch because I'm coming to eat. He also showed forgiveness. He showed forgiveness to the thief on the cross when he said, you will be with me in paradise. And by the way, that thief wasn't just a common thief. He was probably a, led a rebellion against Rome, perhaps a murderer. I, I, I want you to notice, he showed forgiveness to the disciples, as we talked about a few weeks ago, when he reinstated them, if you will, even though they had abandoned him and denied him. He showed forgiveness to the woman caught in adultery. But he didn't stop there. We not only need to show love, acceptance, and forgiveness, we need to show hope. Jesus showed hope to the woman caught in adultery when he said, go and what? Sin no more. Jesus showed hope when he told the lepers, go and show yourself to the priests so that you can go back and enter into life in your homes and be with your family members once more. Jesus showed hope over and over again, and he showed hope when he told the disciples, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you, and since I am going to prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you 
unto myself so that you can be with me where I am. We need to have the kind of Christ-like lives and live as Jesus lived. And we can only do that if we have a life of prayer, if compassion and love are the motivation for how we deal with other people. If we are more interested in inviting people to know the Father than simply teaching what we think to be right and wrong. And if we have servants' hearts. May we all live as Jesus lived.